For many people, in the days of the gold rush, the horizon beckoned. The wild west, a land of opportunities. Others noticed ominous clouds on the same horizon. In our era, the data rush, which needs to fulfill many regulatory requirements, there are also lots of opportunities. Some would consider them ominous opportunities. I know it's a contradictionary phrase, but a similar contradiction is seen in Europe, where on the one hand the European Parliament is asking for an action plan to phase out the use of animals in science, and on the other hand the EU's big ambitions of the chemical strategy for sustainability will lead to unavoidable increasing of animal testing. In today's interview we will investigate data generation and data sharing opportunities with Patient Brown from the OECD and Ophelia Beckeru from the European Chemicals Agency. Ladies, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Ophelia, let's start with all the data already submitted to ECHA for EU REACH and collected by other EU agencies and institutions. The Commission is aiming to create a common open platform on chemical safety data, a kind of online data bank. Can you tell us more about this initiative? Yes, of course. Um, the, the European Chemical Data Platform is part of the One Substance, One Assessment initiative under the Chemical Strategy. The aim of the platform is uh, to support a more efficient and effective uh, assessment by, uh, by authorities by putting all the data from uh, uh, the different databases in, in a single point of access. So basically this would allow industry, authorities um, uh, to, to have access uh, to, to that data and use all available uh, data for making a more coherent and, and more consistent uh, assessment. Okay, is there already a timeline uh, when this could be implemented? Um, ECA has been working on, on an implementation plan uh, that was now submitted to, to the Commission. Commission is working on, on the uh, data regulation, which is basically the the legal act uh, that would uh, enable uh, further development of the platform. Um, the implementation plan foresees uh, that uh, over three years uh, we will have the basis. It will be a modular approach which would mean that it's possible in, in the future to, to add other data. And perhaps also relevant to, to say that it would uh, comprise uh, data on the intrinsic properties of, of the substances, but also monitoring data, academic data. So it's, it's really like a, a single point of uh, access that so. would facilitate uh, more, uh, more consistent approaches to, to safety assessment. So it will contain a lot of data. Now with mm -hmm. databases it's always important eh, to have correct and validated data. How do you intend to sieve out the real valuable data and how will the data platform improve the quality of safety assessment? The platform itself uh, would, would not promote validation of, uh, of the data but would, uh, would sieve out uh, what is uh, available and uh, will use it based on uh, the rules that are, uh, are already available for considering the, the quality of data. So for instance, uh, we could use the OECD uh, criteria for GOP approved tests, stuff like that. Yes, they, they are already there. Uh, this uh, this um, is not necessarily something coming through the database. These are underlying principles that are already embedded in, in the legislation, in the requirements, but it would become more visible what is the, the quality of the data and, and well, yeah, what is the data that it's, it's already validated. No, I was asking it because you also said academic data and that mm -hmm. might be no, yeah, less GLP certified. So the, the aim is to have a database with validated data, at least based on the criteria as we know them at uh, mm -hmm. ECA at the moment. Uh, not necessarily only validated data, so basically all the data that could be used for, uh, for safety assessment. And there are also projects going on on how to facilitate the use of academic data and in the future for, for safety assessment. As we know, there is a lot of data generated in, uh, in, in research projects that could be used for uh, supporting uh, regulatory assessments. And especially when we think about the, the new approach uh, methods, uh, they are um, uh, rather available from, from the research uh, area. And uh, having a um, platform would, that would facilitate also the, uh, um, the um, 
inclusion of academic data will, will help to consider also this, uh, these alternatives. Okay. If hey, I, oops, sorry, go ahead, if I could no? jump in here, just to note that, uh, as Ophelia mentioned, this is a, a subject that's a, of a lot of interest to a lot of different authorities, and recently there was an OECD project that was initiated by the Joint Research Center of the European Commission to look at how to improve the use of academic data in, in risk assessments. So part of what they're doing is building under the OECD and with an expert group, is building a, a list of resources to start with on guidance on how to do that, how to conduct searches and how to evaluate the quality of data for exactly what you just mentioned. And then hopefully as a second part of that project or a follow-up under OECD, there will be an OECD harmonized template for reporting such data so they can be not only harmonized, included in a common data platform, for example, but also reused by, by a number of different authorities or interested parties. Okay. Ophelia, uh, as indicated, data can be valuable and uh, therefore um, compensation payments are due for non-data owners that like to purchase, for instance, uh, under EU REACH, a letter of access so that they can refer to such uh, uh, data. Such data compensation payments for the summaries are limited to 12 years at the moment for the data part. Is there an opportunity that this data then also becomes available, perhaps even for other authorities? The platform and, and, uh, and the whole concept of one substance, one assessment aims to facilitate the reuse of data by authorities. Uh, for example, if data is generated under reach, that, that could be used for uh, evaluation under pesticides, for example, or under food contact materials. Um, as such, um, there is, as far as I know, no proposal to change the intellectual property rights. Um, nevertheless, the Commission is looking into how to facilitate the reuse of data by authorities. This uh, n the n concept needs to be enabled through, through the legislation to uh, remove the so-called barriers for, uh, for, remove, uh, for uh, reuse of the data. This is something that the Commission is, is looking into. Um, and it's, um, we are already sharing uh, information with, uh, with agencies at, uh, at EU level um, because this is also part, uh, part of our obligations under REACH to make sure that there is consistency of uh, the opinions. Um, however, um, this data cannot be readily reused in the assessments by, by other authorities and this is something that uh, will, will need to be addressed. Um, and as mentioned, um, there, there is no um, work or um, no, no proposal to change uh, the, um, the CBI, the, um, the intellectual property rights on, uh, on the data. This is something to be negotiated by, uh, by the, the applicants' industry. Um, nevertheless, having such a platform and then facilitating uh, having more transparent access to, to the information would also help industry to understand what is available and um, eventually um, ensure that uh, the, the cooperation, the, the data sharing mechanism uh, between industry could move on uh, quicker. Okay. Hey, when we talk about sharing between authorities, we're talking about EU authorities, and eh? yes. that's important. Uh, patients, um, a lot of things happening within the EU, uh, but also outside, mutual acceptance of data is very much important. What initiatives are considered to secure this mutual acceptance? So, first of all, the principles of mutual acceptance of data are really about uh, the results of OECD validated test guidelines that are conducted in a laboratory that are following good laboratory practices. So, it's a relatively strict definition of the term. Um, so, first of all, OECD is considering how these new approach methods and other emerging science can be covered under GLP. Uh, the working group has uh, started drafting a document to provide guidance on just such a thing that include things like computational approaches and artificial intelligence and cloud-based algorithms, so really forward thinking. In addition, the Test Guidelines Program recently held uh, the first of what are likely to be several workshops on modernizing validation, and that was held in December of 2022. Uh, the workshop report should be out any day now publicly available. 
Uh, but this is really the modernization of thinking about how to accelerate the process and how to make room for some of these new approach methods. Uh, in addition, we have a number of initiatives to increase familiarity and standardization of new approach methods before they become test guidelines to get regulatory authorities familiar with them to, to find the strengths and weaknesses and to harmonize how they're reported, for example. So I think there's really broad thinking around this. The hope is that in every way possible we'll harmonize the, the methods and how they're reported as much as can be done. Okay, you already touched on new methods. Eh? So what initiatives are being undertaken to promote data mining and sharing of existing data? Uh, so in terms of sharing of existing data, there are a number of ways that we try to, to harmonize the formats. Uh, Ophelia already mentioned the OECD harmonized templates. There are There is a harmonized template for every test guideline result and they're also amenable to non-test guideline results. Uh, there's a, an OHT specifically on mechanistic data. There are new OHTs proposed all the time, but in addition there are standardized formats for reporting all sorts of other types of data like omics data, uh, physiological based kinetic modeling, uh, and so forth. So I think that's one of the, the many ways that we, we think about it. Okay. Uh, the new approach methodologies, so they can be part of an integrated strategy for new generation risk assessments. What are the opportunities and challenges of this new generation risk assessment for environmental and human health protection? Yeah, well, the, the new generation risk assessment, uh, it's, it's a lot about integration of uh, uh, information on um, hazardous properties with exposure. Um, and as such, in, in, in Europe and especially under REACH, uh, we have clear information for hazardous properties, uh, standard information requirements that should allow in, in the end uh, drawing conclusions on, on the classification and, and risk assessment. So I'm not going to talk too much about this new generation <laughs> risk assessment, uh, but more about the, the challenges of, of using um, new approach methods and in general alternative approaches for um, for the hazard identification, because this is one of the main uh, goals of, of uh, European legislation, uh, reach, uh, reach and, and CLP. And uh, I think one, uh, one of the challenges, one of the major challenges here is how we define adversity in, in, in uh, relation to especially on, on the animal testing, because adversity is what leads to, to classification and then also uh, subsequently to, to risk management measures. This is one of, one of the main challenges. Uh, another challenge in the uptake of uh, NAMS uh, is also the, the fact that very often NAMS are also associated with a level of exposure, internal exposure. Um, and the fact that there are different requirements in, in, in the different uh, jurisdictions hampers a bit on, on how we look at NAMS and, and how we approach NAM developments, uh, NAM development that it's, uh, it's suitable for the regulatory purposes. There are, however, a, a number of initiatives, uh, like for example the APCRA project, which looks into developing NAMS uh, and, and thinking how we could address adversity in, uh, in, in a different manner. Um, there is progress, uh, but there is also um, uh, work uh, still, still to be done. You want to add anything on this? Sure. Yeah, I think uh, you know. I think there are a lot of opportunities as well as challenges. I agree with everything that Ophelia said about the challenges. But in terms of the the new methods, I think in many cases these can be designed to be more human relevant than the traditional animal based test methods. Oftentimes they're much faster and have higher throughput. Uh, in addition, they can be less expensive, and you know they are not, at least by the OECD definition, exclusively animal, non-animal, animal-free. But they certainly support the three R's. Uh, you know, they they oftentimes reduce animal testing, if not eliminate it entirely. So, in terms of opportunities, I think we've seen a number of uh, examples of how these can be used through the the OECD IATA case studies project, so the integrated approaches to testing and assessment, which is essentially what you're talking about, this new generation risk assessment. It's the idea of combining multiple methods together to come to a conclusion. And 
in many cases what we have is an example of the new approach method side by side with traditional animal data and I think it's done a lot to really increase confidence by showing that the same approaches will give the same answer for the same chemicals in many circumstances. Oh, that's a good news then actually. It, do you have some real world examples of uh, maybe certain industries that already did this compare and contrast then? So I'll go first on that one if that's okay. So we have now through the IATA case studies project, I think 37 case studies that have been published and they're searchable on our public website. These have all been submitted with a regulatory context in mind. So oftentimes submitted actually by regulatory authorities or by industry that are giving examples of support for registration. So we have a number of those. Uh, they address a number of different endpoints in, in a variety of different ways. And I won't go through all the details of it, but I think some really nice examples have come from the cosmetics industry. And this of course is, you know, by necessity, given the European legislation requires non-animal testing for cosmetics cosmetics ingredients for almost, well, a decade now. So we have a number of examples of, of new generation risk assessments that address things like skin sensitization, skin irritation, eye irritation, and those examples are available on the website. But I should add also that this has actually led to standardization of some of these approaches and actually fostered the first two defined approach test guidelines. So those same approaches are covered by the mutual acceptance of data and are in harmonized test guidelines under OECD. So they have been fine-tuned and basically now are in place. Exactly. Ophelia, you also wanted to add something to this? Uh, maybe not exactly at the same level, but um, the, if I um, mention, uh, for example, the, the grouping approach, uh, the way ECA moved into assessing chemicals in, in group and addressing the, the risk assessment at the group level, this increased a lot the outputs in, in terms of prioritizing the, the chemicals for, um, for the regulatory uh, step. I think this is, um, although it's, it's not a new method, uh, it helps a lot to reduce animal testing. So in a way it, it has a, a similar <laughs> consequence uh, with, uh, with the NAMS. Uh, and over the, the past years, um, ECA increased considerably the, the outputs by, uh, by addressing chemicals in groups and uh, proposing together with the member states uh, regulatory measures at the group level. Okay, Let, let's look a little bit further on the horizon. Uh, there are many new initiatives that you shared with us. In poker terms, uh, if we can get the royal flush in our hands, uh, we would be champions. Here the royal flush, of course, would be no more animal testing at all. Is that feasible? At least uh, it, it could be a goal. Uh, and uh, if we, uh, if we uh, define the goal, we could work uh, towards it. Um, for example, we, uh, we plan to organize uh, soon and um, in the beginning of, of June a workshop where to discuss the, the approaches for uh, moving uh, outside of uh, animal testing. Uh, we know that this is a challenging <laughs> objective. Um, on the other hand, uh, there have been steps undertaken. It's, it's a matter of agreement at, at different levels on, on the first on, on the regulatory setting uh, and then working towards uh, um, changing the, the way we look at, at the chemicals uh, and, and consider a more predictive uh, approach. Uh, that would eventually mean also being uh, sometimes more and more conservative in, in, in certain aspects, especially uh, during the, the development uh, phase. Um, we have been uh, working uh, recently together with, uh, with uh, colleagues from, from the Commission to consider what would be the, the critical needs to move away from, from animal testing. One uh, important element is the increase in, in confidence in, uh, in the alternatives, but it's, it's also developing the, um, the alternatives that further in, in a way that would reduce the number of false positives, because this would um, increase confidence from, from all sides in, in, in such methods. Okay. Patience, is the EU leading the pack here, or are we seeing similar, no, yeah approaches around the globe? 
I think there's a global transition towards new, using new approach methods. And just to build a little bit on, on what Ophelia just said to the last question, and I agree with everything she said there as well, uh, I think there's going to be a transition period. You know, What we have now is um, a number of new approach methods that address, in general, acute toxicity endpoints. And these are some of probably the most simple endpoints to address, but of course they're the proof of concept. So we start with the methods we have, we find solutions that don't require animal testing, and I think now as we look towards the future and around the globe this is beginning to happen, what we look at is the more complex endpoints and how to build new approach methods to address those. Uh, you know, the developmental neurotoxicity example is a very good example of really designing new assays that will address the biology, and I think these types of approaches we'll see more and more. We've seen not only uh, you know, the initiatives in the EU, but the US EPA has been incredibly active in this for over a decade now with their ToxCast program. But we're starting to see international collaboration to address some of the more complex endpoints. DNT was one that I mentioned. There's a huge global initiative to find solutions for thyroid disruption, for example. Uh, and this will continue, I think, as we, we find where the gaps are in current methods that are available and current approaches, there'll be a community that builds solutions for that. Okay. Where do you see the future of risk assessment going in the next, say, five to ten years? I'll let Ophelia go first on that <laughs> one. The easy one, right? Um, I think uh, we, we all agree that there is a lot of pressure around the, the globe to, to move uh, away from, from animal uh, testing. And because of that, there, there is also now more investment, more awareness for uh, developing in, in, in this direction. Um, in, in my view, what, uh, the, this is a good direction, of course, but what, uh, what remains very relevant is it's the OECD work and then <coughs> um, facilitating uh, common views and then developing uh, common uh, approaches uh, across the globe. This is uh, beneficial not only for authorities, but also for, uh, for the industry, for providing the, the predictability that, uh, that help uh, industry also to, to move forward. So uh, programs like the, the test guideline, um, the, the promotion of Euclid as, as a uh, template, as a harmonized template for uh, sharing information on intrinsic properties, uh, and in my view, this uh, remain as, as uh, building blocks, as, as pillars of any um, uh, future uh, developments in, in risk assessment. I think a lot of where we are now came from the document that was published by the National, Ma National Academies of Science in 2007, uh, Toxicity Testing in the 21st Century, which was really about using pathway-based approaches and mechanistic information to link to adverse outcomes. And the adverse outcome pathway thinking was part of that, emerged from that. And what we have now is examples of tying mechanistic information in a predictive fashion to predict uh, adverse outcomes. So again, a proof of concept example of how these approaches can be used, but I think we're starting to consider how we can use approaches that might be protective rather than predictive. For example, a lot of the omics points of departure work doesn't necessarily tie the change to an adverse outcome, but in fact says something has been perturbed here. So obviously that is very far down the road looking. Uh, it would require a change in policy as well as a change in how the data are considered, but I think it's a possibility for our future. Final question. The data sharing concept, although simple in theory, can quickly become complicated due to uh, issues around cross-jurisdictional data sharing, like between EU REACH, Tosca, Korea REACH, Turkey's KK DIG, and Duke REACH recently. Any suggestions for companies and maybe authorities to facilitate data sharing here? Maybe I can go first because my, my answer is relatively short. <laughs> Uh, there's a new project under OECD to look at possibilities for data sharing and there are, will be some best practices examples from not only authorities but also from industry. And this is a joint project but that was co-led by the OECD Secretariat and industry so there's obviously a lot of interest in that. And the hope is that uh, not only from these best practices examples, but also from a lot of what Ophelia talked about, about having a, a common data platform with a high degree of transparency, industry will be aware that the data are available in the first place and there'll be some guidance on how to facilitate data sharing around that too. Any indication when we can expect the results from this? 
Well, I can tell you that the project just began, so uh, I would expect it would be a couple of years away until there are documents produced from that, but there's a lot of interest and support. And maybe in October at CanCon Europe we can get a first glimpse of what is happening? Uh, an update, perhaps, an yes. Update. <laughs> Perfect. Patience and Ophelia, thank you very much for your valuable insight in data sharing opportunities. With the many data requirements in other regions, data sharing remains a poker game. Will the data rush be ominous or is it an opportunity? Mm -hmm.